Our scripture reading this morning is 1 Chronicles 13, 1 through 4. David conferred with each of his officers, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds. He then said to the whole assembly of Israel, If it seems good to you, and if it is the will of the Lord our God, let us send word far and wide to the rest of our brothers throughout the territories of Israel, and also to the priests and Levites who are with them in their towns and pasture lands to come and join us. Let us bring the ark of our God back to us, for we did not inquire of it during the reign of Saul. The whole assembly agreed to do this because it seemed right to all the people. Thank you, Jim, for that reading. And thank you all for being here this morning. I feel like we have already done so much. We accomplished so much uh, this morning. And just one more time, let's, let's pray as we begin this morning. Our Father, we invite you to be with us as we are gathering here this morning. May you tune our hearts in the direction and the posture of leaning towards you. Father, we want to be intentional about our commitment to you. And so, Lord, we pray that you may speak to us this morning. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. On February, in February 18, 1967, Tory Canyon was one of the biggest ships and one of the best ships in the world, left Kuwait National Petroleum Company refinery on her voyage to a full cargo of crude oil. The planned route was to Melford Haven in Wales. Sadly, Tory Canyon struck Pollard's Rock on Seven Stones Reef between the Cornish mainland and the Isles of Scilly and became grounded and eventually sank. Upon further inquiry, it was found that Captain Pastrengo Rugiati was to blame because he took a shortcut to arrive at his destination. Additionally, a design fault meant that the helmsman was unaware that the steering selector switch had been accidentally left on autopilot and hence was unable to carry out a timely turn to go through the shipping channel, crashing into the rocks ahead. What compels me about this story is the things that Torrey Canyon represents. As it plows down to the obvious disaster, and yet, for a mystifying reason, it doesn't seem to be able to change course. The course seems like madness, but the type of thinking that resulted in this risky maneuver is something that we are all prone to. We all, in one way or another, just like Captain Pastrengo Rugiati, set a course for disaster at some stage in our lives. We've tried the shortcuts of life only to realize that they are rocks ahead. Whether it is in our marriage, or whether it is with our family, or whether it is in our job, or in an old or new relationship, the reality is that we've all experienced a moment in our lives when we have struggled to admit it until it's too late. And our life ships goes crashing down into the depths of the sea. And just like the Torrey Canyon, the best ship in the world, you might find yourself unable to turn your life ship around into a secure shipping channel. It feels like you are just on autopilot going through the motions of life or maybe just the opposite. Maybe you're sitting down here this morning and you feel confident, you feel self-sufficient, you feel like you're in control of your life only to find out that sooner or later, the course of life, there are dangerous rocks ahead. 
and you go crashing down. Sometimes, like Captain Pastrango Rugiati, we too know that there is something missing. It feels like this ache, like this itch, like there is something wrong, and yet we stubbornly continue our course without thinking of the deadly consequences. Psychologists call the continuation of an original plan, even when information suggests that the plan should be abandoned, plan continuation bias. Pilots more commonly refer it to at, as get their itis. It is this unconscious bias that appear stronger the closer you are in accomplishing the activity. In other words, plan continuation bias is this unconscious cognitive bias to continue with the original plan in spite of changing conditions. It's, it clouds our judgment and we begin to make irrational decisions. The tunnel vision develops and we don't think about alternatives or are changing our plan from the initial plan. We don't have that bandwidth, so we just continue to plow on. And so this morning, the question for us is, how do we navigate the dangerous waters of life? How or to whom do we turn when facing the challenges of life? Let me tell you, in an instant, in a moment, we can be navigating all well. And in a moment, in an instant, everything changes forever. We can be doing so well, and in a moment, that is taken away from us. So we are beginning a new series, Revival and Awakening. A short series about our hearts yearning, longing, and burning for the God's presence in our lives. So I invite you to turn with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 13. 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verse, starting in verse 1. The sermon title this morning is Seeking the Presence of God. Our story takes us where King David is speaking after he has taken the throne He's now been through all the trials, all the tribulations, but through all that, he's learned to rely on the Lord. But God's giving him an army, favor, confidence, and now he actually has the throne. And the Bible says, are you with me? First Chronicles 13. Then David consulted with the captains of thousands of hundreds and with every leader and David said to all the assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you, and if it is, and it is of the Lord our God, let us send to our brethren everywhere who are left in the land of Israel and to whom, and with whom to the priests and the Levites who are in the cities and their common lands, that they may gather together to us. Verse 3 is our key text this morning. And it says, And let us bring the ark of God back to us, for we have not inquired at it since the days of Saul. Then all the assembly said that they would do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. Now, this is such an interesting paradigm on the one side, it mentions the reign of Saul, or in some other Bible's translations or versions, it says, in the days of Saul. But look at the contrast in the Bible when it presents the days of Saul to the days of David. The Ark of the Covenant had been returned from the Philistines over 20 or, or, 20 or earlier years ago. Students of the Bible would recall when the Philistines had captured the Ark of God and it went into the temple of Dagon and it falls down. And of course, the Philistines start breaking out in boils and they inquire of their gods and through a miraculous, fascinating, miraculous God's intervention, their own gods say, we need to send it back. And so the ark comes back and ends up in the home of a man who sits on it for 20 years. Go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 7. 1 Samuel chapter 7, starting verse 1. 
the Bible says, Then the man of Kirhas, Jerim, came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Aminadab on the hill and consecrated Eleazar, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. So it was the ark that, re that remained in Kirhas, Jerim, a long time. And it was there 20 years. How many? 20, 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Here you have the ark of God that comes back and ends up in the house of a man who sits on it for 20 years. And what's even more shocking is that Saul knows all about it and does nothing to restore it in its rightful place. Think about the ark and think about what the ark represents. That was God's whole point. What was God's whole point in having the tabernacle? And specifically the most holy place, the Ark of the Covenant was located. The Shekinah glory. That God's very presence would be among them. Exodus chapter 25 verse 8 says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. This was the very center of God's presence in communication with Israel. Yet Saul, the king of Israel, the spiritual leader, the one who had been anointed to be the commander of God's inheritance by the prophet Samuel, had the ark of the Lord sitting in the house of a man for 20 years, accumulating dust. And in the book of Exodus, chapter 33, it says, How will anybody know that you're with us if it's not by your presence? God's whole heart is to be amongst his people, the presence of God that makes us the people of God. And as we transition into the annals of history, we see that Israel had been chosen as the light to all the surrounding nations. Israel was to be faithfully to represent God by all that they did and they lived in a community of love, justice, and worship. In the very center, it would be the, princess, the presence of God with his people. But instead, they said, give us a king like the other nations. And so God said, you want a king, I'm going to give you Saul. And Saul is head over shoulders above everybody else. The Spirit of God comes upon him and he leads, but he doesn't lead reliant in the presence of God. The people scatter. He struggles to, to control. He tries to control the narrative. He tries to control the timing. He tries to control the outcomes. Saul is a man who leads on his own strength through human control. And I wonder for some of us that are sitting here, as I pause for a moment and as we reflect, if we've done that, if we fall under this narrative this morning of we trying to do things on our own without asking for God to help us. And so the priest is sitting there for almost 20 years, two decades. Never once does Saul think, let's go get the presence back. Let's go get the ark back among the people. He's content to go to war with the Philistines, to build a kingdom, to rule, to reign without God in the midst until time runs out. And the kingdom comes, and his kingdom comes to a tragic end. Reread the whole story. We won't have time this morning, but his story is in 1 Chronicles chapter 10. You can read the whole story there where Saul's reign comes to an end. And, and that's really the tragedy of the human experience, right? When we slowly, but surely over time, separate ourselves from God. All that can only happen, the only thing that can happen is death and destruction. The reality is that none of us are immune to the temptations of the enemy. 
we all, one way or another, are being bombarded and attacked, going through troubles, going through temptations. And behind each person is a face sitting here this morning in the pew with a hidden sorrow, with pain, with trouble or challenge in their lives. And the only way that we can navigate the dangerous waters of life in this world is by continually seeking the presence of God. Woe to us if one day we feel like we're good enough on our own that we don't need God anymore. Because what happened to Saul can very well happen to us. The Apostle Paul warns of this very same mindset in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, when he says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. Like Saul, the reality of many Christians today is how the writer and theologian John Mark Comer puts it. One of the great problems of spirituality in our day and age is that so many people feel so many people feel safe enough to admit how separated we feel from God. We rarely experience God's presence throughout our day. Love, joy, peace does not describe the felt experience of many Christians. Often we come to church hoping for a God hit, a fleeting moment of connection to God before we turn into the secular wasteland. There is no real longing, yearning, burning in our hearts for God's presence. We often live in an ultra reality where God's presence is more like a concept than an experience. There's only a fleeting moment of connection and superficial devotion as we go through our day. Like Saul, we are content to build earthly kingdoms to rule and to reign without God in our midst until time runs out out of our kingdom and our kingdom is taken away from us. But Jesus' vision for us and for our lives is so much better than what we could ever imagine. Jesus' vision for our life is one that focuses on the heavenly kingdom, on the things that are eternal, on the things that last forever. I think that's the reason why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also and so going back to our story in 1 Chronicles chapter 10, which describes Saul's death, we read at the very end of that chapter, 1 Chronicles chapter 10, at the very end of that chapter, verse 11, it says, And when all of Jabesh Gilead heard all that the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and took the body of Saul, and the bodies of his sons, and they brought them to Jabesh and buried their bones under the tarnished tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. So Saul died for his unfaithfulness. What, what did I just read? So Saul died for his unfaithfulness, which he had committed against the Lord because he had consulted mediums for guidance, but he did not inquire of the Lord. Therefore, he killed him and turned the kingdom over to David, his son of Jesse. Wow. This is so deep, so profound. And so David ascends to the throne. And what's so interesting to me, it's so fascinating, is that the first thing that David says, and it takes us to our scripture that Jim read so well this morning, which is 1 Chronicles chapter 13. The first thing that David says, verse 3, 
let us bring the ark of our God back to us. For we have not inquired at it since the days of Saul. Here we see a parallelism between the days of Saul and the days of David. Of course, David was not a perfect person by all means. He made several mistakes along the way. But I think where David really resonates with me this morning is that this one thing, he got it right. This one thing, David got right. David saw is leading, ruling, fighting, building without God's presence in his midst. And David said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. And what does David do when he gets power? Notice the first thing he says is, let us go bring back the ark of God. David's first use of his power is to get God's presence in the midst of his people. Because he realizes that without God's presence, there is no blessing. It's not your gifts. It's not your talents your abilities, your personalities, or even your charisma that makes the difference. The only thing that makes the difference is seeking the presence of God. When we realize our mortality, when we realize who we are, and where we come from, all we can do is just recognize God's power in our lives. Imagine what it would look like for us here as a church community this year, if we lived intentionally seeking the presence of God. Imagine what our church would look like when people would walk here to our church. What would people say? Imagine more desperately what our lives would be like if we lived intentionality, with intentionality seeking the presence of God in the midst of our stress, in the midst of our anxiety, in the midst of our challenges. Instead of God being the last option, God is the first option. He's not the last resort, but He's the first resort. Through the mountaintops of prosperity, in the valleys of scarcity, through the highs and the lows of life, in our own personal life, in our work, and even in our church, if God's presence is in the church, then that will be enough for the church. And I don't know about you, but this, my watch tells me here that our year is 13 days old. And already a lot of things have happened. A lot of things have happened. How do I continue? What's the angst, the struggle of the human experience? How do I, how, how do I even have enough strength how do I even have enough courage to, to, to continue on for the rest of the year if it's not by God's presence, by seeking Him? And look what it says, 1 Chronicles 13, verse 7. And so they, they get out and they get excited. We're going to go finally get the ark. And they, and they do it, but they do it with human means. So they carry the ark of God on a new cart from the house of Abinadab and Uzzah and Io drove the cart. Then David and all Israel played music before God with their might, with singing, with harps, on strength instruments, tambourines, cymbals, and with trumpets. They put the, the ark on a cart and in his seal... For God's presence, they didn't pay attention of the holiness to God. They didn't pay attention to God's commands. And so they, when they bring the cart along, Uzzah steadily tries to help God on the way. He has a good heart and God strikes him dead. And the Bible says this made David angry and afraid. And so David regrets, retreats. And he continues into this period of mourning. And he says in verse 12, How can I bring the ark of God to me? Because he's, he's like, man, the thing that, I'm, uh, that I want to do, I don't think I'm going to be able to do what's in my heart. 
But you see, the problem is not the posture of the heart, but the methodology. That's, that's the thing that was wrong. It's still man-centered. It's still pragmatic. It's still the methodology. It's still human dependence. And when we read in verse 13, it says, David would not move the ark with him into the city of David, but he took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in this house for three months. And the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. And that's a whole other sermon right there. And if we had more time, we would dig into that. But for three months, the ark was there. Just because the ark was there, the whole household of Obed-Edom was blessed. Just think about the power that rests on there just because the ark was there in his house. Fast forward to chapter 15. We read that the ark of the covenant is finally brought to Jerusalem. And David says, we have to do it. But if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right so the whole community consecrates themselves to the Lord. The whole community got the right people, which was the priesthood that was supposed to carry the ark. The first time he comes with warriors. The second time he comes with priests. He comes with Levites. And so what do they do? They carry it on their shoulders. This is something that is not built on what humans can make as the Philistines had returned it. No, the ark is being carried on by the right people. And it says that, that they offered multiple sacrifices to the Lord. The heart is in the right place. Everything, everything, when the heart is in the right place, everything is born not out of human means, but of deep devotion, this deep sense of humility and surrender. And I think that's why David later writes in the Psalms of Psalms 51, verse 17, he recognizes that what's at hand is this posture, this surrender. He writes, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Do you remember the story and how we started this morning with the Torrey Canyon, the tragedy that followed and the ship sank at the bottom of the sea? Well, there's a photograph of Captain Pastrango Rugiati that I just can't get out of my head. He struck up in a confined space his knees tucked in in his chest as if to protect himself. His eyes are rode, are rode sharply and to one side. His face is gaseously lit from below. And he is wearing a hospital gown. And he's hiding under the hospital bed. That's where he was when the paparazzi found him. He looked terrified. He's broken. His ship has gone, impaling himself into seven stones at full speed with a noise, one crew man said. It's like a slab of lead being ripped by the stakes, by the spikes. He was the captain. He was the one in charge of the best ship in the world. And for a ship man's captain, his ship is all. And I have lost mine. He said he spent months in the hospital recovering from the strain, from the anxiety, from the heartbreak, which is where the eager photographers found him there sitting, laying there under the bed. And in the old, there's an old saying that says a picture is worth a thousand words. Because you see the picture that was shown there is of a man who is not fighting anymore. 
The picture that is shown on there is a person, is a picture of a man who has given up. Because the picture that was shown on there is a person who is not fighting anymore, but a person who has just given up and realizes that everything is gone. And I don't know, I don't know if this morning you feel that way. I know it's a little bit too early in the year. It's only 13, year, 13 days. But I don't know if you feel and you came in walking through those doors this morning and say, ah, already, just carrying this load, this baggage. He spent months in the hospital recovering. And in the words of Eugene Peterson, I think he, he puts it so well. And he says, life in the world is often difficult, but living with God's constant presence and eternal hope allows us to experience joy no matter what we face. Did you get that? God's presence in our life is always the reason for joy. Because no matter what we're experiencing this moment, no matter the heartache, no matter the troubles, we can have joy in the presence of Jesus. We can have hope that there is something much better for us. And for the modern Christian, as in ancient times, we too can choose how we want to live. I want to live with joy. I want to live with longing. I want to live with surrender. Yes, it won't be easy, but how do we navigate these dangerous waters of this world? The only way I know is by continually seeking the presence of God in our daily lives. And so this morning, whatever you came in, however you feel, whatever is weighing down in your shoulders, I invite you to give it to Jesus. Do not let it carry on. Walk off these doors knowing that the presence of God is with you and that that is enough. So let us stand as we sing our last hymn, which is hymn 473, Nearer My God to Thee, Nearer My God to Thee. Dear Heavenly Father, as we have just sung these words, May we internalize them. May we live, Lord, constantly seeking your presence. Because we know, Lord, that at the very end, the only way how we will be able to meet these challenges that we are experiencing at this moment is just being close to thee. And so, Lord, give us boldness. Give us courage. Give us strength to carry on, knowing that you are there with us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.